five minutes went away fast, especially with talking and, and uh, enjoying one another. So let's all stand together this morning and let's just pray over this whole service. Lord, we pray that you would have your way in this place. Lord, you be glorified and honored and lifted on high. In Jesus' name, amen. Sing this out. Here we go. When I'm in the roughest water, I won't go under, I won't drown. When I'm in over my head, I know that you won't let me down. When I'm broken and down to nothing, I know that you are always up to something good. I know that you are always up to something good. You'll make a way whatever it takes. There's nothing you love won't endure. I know that you are always up to something good. And even through. take a few seconds, just greet someone around you this morning. got all quiet. <laughs> How's everybody today? Well, I'm glad. It's sun is shining. It's a good day. 
Hey, we have a few announcements that we want to go over. And we got some uh, fellows that are going to come up and share some things with you. Um, uh, before <clears throat> we take care of all of that, I wanted to just take a minute. I uh, had an opportunity, obviously, Wednesday. Uh, the Board of Elders went out and met uh, Weston and Casey and prayed with Weston and Casey. And yesterday I was out uh, visiting Casey. <clears throat> Weston, uh, they sent something out to the prayer chain for those maybe who have seen it or those who haven't. Weston asked me to read it uh, for you guys this morning, so I'm going to read it to you. This is uh, from Weston and Casey Becker. First off, we have been greatly blessed by all the prayer and support. We wanted to give an update on Casey. Her liver is very enlarged, most likely due to the cancer, so she, so she will no longer receive chemo treatments to fight the cancer. The liver could not handle any more treatments due to its reduced function. Casey is currently on home hospice and is suffering quite a bit. She is moving towards the end of her journey here on earth and nearing the beginning of eternity with Christ. We continue to pray and believe for complete healing in Casey's body. But if it is time for Casey to go home to be with the Lord, we will miss her very much, but rejoice in knowing that she is with Jesus forever. We leave it in God's hands. We ask that you would continue to pray for us through the next part of the journey as we don't know what it holds. We know God has been and continues to be faithful through all of this. He has a good plan ahead. We encourage everyone to keep their eyes on Jesus no matter what. He is everything we need. We understand life can get really hard sometimes, but know that Jesus will always be there. So don't lose hope because God is on the throne and in control, even when we don't understand everything that's going on. Again, we want to say thank you for your continued prayer and support for us. We know God hears and all this will work for his glory. Please continue to pray for us. We need it every day. The Beckers. So Casey is home on hospice now. Um, my commitment to them, I told them I'll continue to pray that God heals until the Lord takes you home. So ultimately, uh, that's not second prize or, you know, that's. That's the ultimate prize, getting to see Jesus Christ, So, and also the ultimate healing. So we're praying for them, praying for the kids. They have uh, four children, so uh, we want to be keeping the family lifted up, keep them in prayer. <clears throat> if, uh, if you would like to visit, uh, you can give the family a call and, and uh, check in, and if, uh, if that works out, you guys can... Stop in and say, hey, tell them you love them. Um, great opportunity to do that. So we want to uh, encourage you guys to keep praying, keep lifting them up, and, and we'll see what God will do uh, for Weston and Casey. So keep that in mind. Also want to let you guys know that we have family camp this week. So there are some campers up there now. If you guys are joining us, uh, Feel free to join us anytime between now and and uh, Sunday. Next Sunday we'll have Church in the Woods. So if you're not camping and you'd like to come up to the woods for the day, you can come up to Pine. We'll be up there doing Church in the Woods. If you're not camping, don't worry about it. There will still be church here. Uh, so you guys are welcome to come and worship together in that. Now, along the lines of family camp, we have an announcement. So Ron's going to come tell you about uh, a I'm not going to do it for you. Ron, Ron's going to come tell you about some special opportunities. You were doing so well. I was. Huh? So, big surprise. Family camp this week. Starts on Thursday, goes through Sunday. Um, Bronco Flats. If uh, you don't know how to get there, you can check with one of us. It's really easy to get to. Pretty much everybody knows where Johnson's Bridge is and Elk Flats. As soon as you cross the bridge, you turn right, and then you go down the gravel road. It's called Old Logtown Road, uh, about a half a mile, and it's on your right-hand side. So we went up this weekend and parked a couple of trailers to try to take up some spots, and um, 
you're encouraged to do so. I mean, if you're able to do that, you know, now that the weekend's over, I'm sure a lot of people will be leaving. But we can't reserve spots up there because it's for general public. So we did make arrangements to have restrooms up there. And there is no charge for camping up there this year. Um, although we would take donations to cover the cost of the bathrooms because those were quite a bit more expensive than we thought they were going to be. So uh, you can get a hold of Kathy or myself or pretty much anybody and, and uh, do your donation if you'd like to. Um, because of COVID this year, we're not going to do the, the Dutch oven cooked off as a group, but you're welcome to do group things. You're welcome to bring the family. We'd love to have you up there. It's a wonderful time. There's water sports up there. There's trails to ride. There's hiking to do if you're into that labor stuff. But um, otherwise, you could bring a motorized version and, and have some fun. But we'd love to see you up there. And uh, if you have any questions, let us know. Thanks. Okay, guys, I have one quick announcement. I started working with an organization called Eat Smart Idaho. So from Idaho Food Bank, they have over 700 boxes of food um, to donate to any families that say they're in need. So I don't know if you guys are in need or someone you know, just there's a flyer on the front door and then on the children's ministry door in the fellowship hall. But it's basically, it's in English and Spanish. It's next Saturday when we're at family camp. But if some people want, are staying back and need food, it's gonna be boxes full of fresh produce and canned goods, but mostly like potatoes, bananas, um, and different like apples, things like that. And so it's gonna be from 10 a.m. to 2 p.m at the um, Twin Falls County offices. there's It's a drive-through distribution, so on the back of this flyer on the front door, if you wanna go get more information, it shows the pattern of where you can drive up, get your two boxes of food, and then go out into the traffic. So anyway, I just wanted to let you guys know it's a great opportunity to let anyone you know that is in need during this time to get food and to get good food. It's not just a bunch of mac and cheese, it's fresh produce too. So thanks guys. Everybody's stealing everybody else's thunder this morning. <laughs> Here's the same announcement, but I have more information uh, for you. What you don't know is that you folks help keep mustard seed going every week. Uh, we as a board decided to, to uh, use the mustard seed as our source of benevolence every month, and we donate $1,000 a month when we don't use it for the people in our body. So whatever the balance is, Krista sends a check over to the mustard seed to uh, Dennis Moon and Liz and they distribute it. Lloyd DeWitt is the head of the food bank in there. He called me this week, told, showed me how much food he has. It's unbelievable. They cannot give it out fast enough. So don't feel like you're you know, a homeless, indigent kind of person. I would be there if I was gonna be be in town, but we're having a family reunion up at Redfish. So, uh, but anyways, make sure and take an, take advantage of this because they have incredible food, and uh, uh, so that's next Saturday at 10 o'clock. Uh, also, there will be no men's breakfast next week because the cook will be and the cooks will be elsewhere. So sorry about that. Um, gonna have to hit McDonald's. All right, a couple other quick things. We got uh, nursery and Sunday school volunteers are needed. We have uh, nursery and Sunday school back up and running. So if you are willing to help out, as always is the case, they always need help. So I uh, just wanna let that you know, see uh, Levi or Amanda uh, to talk to them about that if you're willing to be a part of it. Also, I wanna let you know we're doing Pollock at the pastor's house. So July 12th, that's the Sunday before VBS. Trust me, the Sunday before VBS, you are going to need to spend some time at the pastor's house. <laughs> we'll, maybe we'll do some special prayer for VBS, and uh, we're going to set up volleyball nets and have some fun and just have an uh, opportunity to come hang out. If, you're, if you are at all uptight about potlucking, just bring yourself what you want to eat and eat it. So we won't be uptight if you have a bag of chicken you don't want to share. It's all right. We won't look funny at you or nothing. 
You guys, uh, you guys just come. We just want to get together. So for those of you who are saying, well, well we don't know where to go. It's potluck at the pastor's house. What, do you come to my house. So my house is at the top of Main. You guys know where Main Street is in Buell? There's only one of them. It's right down the road. Go down Broadway to Main. Turn right. Go to the very top. of a stop sign. And then there's a two-story gray house you're looking at. That's my house. It's got a bridge. Yes, you can drive on the bridge. You won't fall into the canal. So you might hit the bridge. I've got, uh, I got a new bed on my truck twice because my wife doesn't know that she can't quite make that turn. <laughs> well, she only ru ruined it once. Then uh, I won't talk about how I did it. Then, uh, but, or you can go up Juniper, Main turns into Juniper, go up on Juniper and park in front of the house, got a big round driveway, a uh, little uh, dirt lot in the back of the property, you can park back there, you can park wherever you want to park, we just want to spend some time and get to know you guys. So that's July 12th, that's the Sunday before VBS, we'll do church here, and then we'll all head over to my house, and you guys can hang out as long as you want, and uh, we'll just sit Weather should be great, probably be roasty, toasty, nice and hot. Uh, if it gets too hot, I'll turn on the sprinklers or something, and we can run in the sprinklers and cool off. So uh, hopefully you'll come and be a part of that with us. Uh, also, obviously, then also the next day is VBS. VBS kicks off on the 13th. So uh, we'd uh, love to have your help. Come on out and be a part of what's going on at VBS. Um, I don't know what's going to be like this year, because this year, in case you guys haven't noticed, 2020 is going down in the record books as an uh, incredibly weird year. So I don't know. Normally, I would say we'd have 100 kids, so maybe we will. Maybe we'll have less. Maybe we'll have more. I don't know. But uh, we can use your help. So if you want to help feeding, if you want to help, we usually we make them some lunch. we got snacks and stuff like that. If you want to take a tribe, if you, whatever you want to do, there's a spot for you to do it. So again, you want to talk to Levi and Amanda, we'll, they'll get you plugged in on that so that you can be a part of it. I think that's everything. Does that sound like everything? Hey, oh, the float. <laughs> it wasn't everything. So we have a, we're going to do a float. Are you doing it, Savannah? So Savannah's doing the float. Everybody looks back, she's going to wave. If you want to help her with the float, <laughs> She's the one. Hey, she'll feed you. So, we are doing a float. You guys, we, we'd love to have your help setting it up. Being a part of Fourth of July around here is a pretty big deal. So, so hopefully that continues. We hope that uh, you guys will help out with that. See Savannah, if you want to help, she'll give you more information so you can plug in. Let's pray for our nation. <clears throat> Father God. We lift this time to you, Lord. We pray, God, that you would uh, be with our nation, Lord. There is a lot of upheaval, a lot of strife, a lot of pain, a lot of frustration, uh, Lord, on all sides of the aisle. God, we pray that uh, you, by your spirit, might empower your people to, to be the voice of uh, calm in the situation, Lord. We pray that you might empower your people to be uh, a light unto the gospel to lead uh, men and women to you, Lord. We pray, God, that you would give wisdom to the leadership, uh, all leadership, Lord. Governors need wisdom, mayors need wisdom, uh, people all around the nation, Lord, are more divided than ever, Lord. We pray, God, that you uh, might use this opportunity to bring unity, Lord. We pray, God, that you would uh, give wisdom to our president, give him godly leaders around him to give him good counsel. Uh, Lord, we know that you are the one who can come walking on the water in the midst of the storm. We know that you are the one who can lift his eyes to heaven and say, peace be still, and everything will be still. We know that you are the King of kings and Lord of lords, and so, Lord, we lift our eyes up to the heavens, for we know where our help comes from. We know that you are the answer that this world needs, and we pray, God, that you would equip your people to deliver uh, that good news and that we might see uh, healing begin to take place across our nation. Lord, we put her before you and ask your blessing. Lord, we also want to lift up Casey to you and 
Weston right now, Lord, and just pray that you strengthen them for the journey before them. We thank you for their witness. We thank you for her love and his love of you, Lord God, that their family is centered and grounded in you. And we just pray, God, your spirit to be upon their house right now, your comfort and peace in their lives. And Lord, that you would do a perfect work in Casey's life as we lift her to you in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Let's all stand again this morning. have sinned before and if you're not raising your hand you're a liar <laughs> aren't you thankful for such a gracious and mighty God that when everything else fades away when this life fades away here on earth when things don't quite go our way that God is still in control and that he loves us so much that he would die for us and that he would be in this place with us right now just comforting every one of you. I'm, I'm thankful for God's grace. I'm thankful for, for the peace of God that passes all understanding. And we can have joy even when we go through battles and valleys. God, thank you that you are in this place right now. God, thank you for your grace. Thank you for your mercy. God, let us step out of your way, God, and let you have full control over our lives. May you be glorified and honored. Lord, as we sing praises to your name. Yes. 
Oh 
Oh, 
touching every heart. I worship you. I worship you. You are here, healing every heart. I worship you. I worship you. Cause you are way maker, miracle worker. Promise keep light in the darkness, my God, that is who you are. Yes, you are. We miracle work. Promise keep light in the darkness, my God, that is who you are. You are here, turning lives around. I would Bending every heart, I worship you. I worship. You. Sing, you are, yes, you are. Way maker, miracle worker, promise keeper, light in the darkness. My God, that is who you are. Yes, He is way maker, way maker, miracle worker. Promise keep light in the darkness, my God, that is who you are. See way maker, way make miracle work. Promise keep light in the darkness, my God, that is who you are. Yes, you are. Way make miracle work. Promise keep light in the darkness, my God. That is who you are. 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 see it you're working even when I don't feel it you're working never stop never stop working never stop never stop working even when I don't see it you're working even when I don't feel it you're working you never stop never stop working never stop never stop even when even when I don't see it you're working even when I don't Feel that you're working, you never stop, you never stop working, never stop, working. Never stop. Never even stop when I don't, even when I don't see it, you're working, even when I don't feel it, you're working, never stop, never stop working, never stop, you are way maker, miracle work, promise keep light in the darkness, my God. That is who you are, Jesus, way maker, way maker, miracle work, promise keep light in the darkness, my God, that is who you are, because you are way maker, miracle worker, promise keep light in the darkness, my God, that is who you are. who you are. Sing it again. Waymaker. Waymaker. Miracle worker. Promise keeper. Light in the darkness. My God. That is who you are. One more time. Waymaker. Waymaker. Miracle worker. Promise keeper. Light in the darkness. My God. That is who you are. Father God, we thank you for 
the opportunity we have to be gathered here. Lord, we thank you that you are a miracle worker. God, we thank you that you are working even now. Thank you for your spirit moving in this place. Thank you for preparing us, Lord. Thank you for lifting our eyes to cast our value upon you, for you are worthy. Lord, we praise your holy name. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. You can be seated. This morning we're going to continue in John chapter 2, and we're going to read the whole chapter. John chapter 2. On the third day there was a wedding at Cana in Galilee, and the mother of Jesus was there. Jesus also was invited to the wedding with his disciples. When the wine ran out, the mother of Jesus said to him, They have no wine. And Jesus said to her, Woman, what does this have to do with me? My hour has not yet come. His mother said to the servants, do whatever he tells you. Now there were six stone water jars there for the Jewish writs of purification, each holding 20 or 30 gallons. Jesus said to the servants, fill the jars with water. And they filled them up to the brim. And he said to them, now draw some out and take it to the master of the feast. So they took it. When the master of the feast tasted the water, now became wine and did not know where it came from, though the servants who had drawn the water knew. The master of the feast called the bridegroom and said to him, Everyone serves the good wine first, and when people have drunk freely, then the poor wine. But you have kept the good wine until now. This, the first of his signs, Jesus did at Cana in Galilee and manifested his glory, and his disciples believed in him. After this, he went down to Capernaum with his mother and his brothers and his disciples, and they stayed there for a few days. The Passover of the Jews was at hand, and Jesus went up to Jerusalem. In the temple he found those who were selling oxen and sheep and pigeons and the money changers sitting there. And making a whip of cords, he drove them all out of the temple with the sheep and oxen. And he poured out the coins of the money changers and overturned their tables. And he told those who sold the pigeons, take these things away. Do not make my father's house a house of trade. His disciples remembered that it was written, zeal for your house will consume me. So the Jews said to him, what sign do you show us for doing these things? Jesus answered them, Destroy this temple, and in three days I will raise it up. The Jews then said, It has taken 46 years to build this temple, and will you raise it up in three days? But he was speaking about the temple of his body. When therefore he was raised from the dead, his disciples remembered that he had said this, and they believed the scripture and the word that Jesus had spoken. Now, when he was in Jerusalem at the Passover feast, many believed in his name when they saw the signs that he was doing. But Jesus, on his part, did not entrust himself to them because he knew all people and needed no one to bear witness about man, for he himself knew what was in man. Let's pray. Lord, I just pray this morning um, that you would cleanse this temple. Lord, that each one of us, as we listen to your word this morning, um, could just receive from your Holy Spirit. Lord, just uh, those places in our lives that we need to make right, I pray you would quicken us. Lord, that you would anoint your word as it goes forth to do its intended purpose. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, as we uh, begin this morning, 
let me start by saying Happy Father's Day, dads. It's a great opportunity for us to honor fatherhood. Charles Spurgeon said something. He said, I believe the holier a man becomes, the more he mourns over the unholiness that remains in him. We come to a section of scripture here uh, that we're going to be focusing on the, the cleansing of the temple. And the idea of the cleansing of the temple is, is this concept that there's a couple of things that Jesus is focused in on. As he begins his ministry, we want to remember that when John comes and he's, he's got a purpose for every story he gives us. And his purpose is that Jesus did many other signs in the presence of the disciples which are not written in this book. But these are written for what purpose? That you may believe, what? Jesus is the Christ, the Messiah, the Son of God, and by believing, you may have life in his name. Every story. Every story is for that purpose. John, as he brings this gospel together, he's focused on that. And so as we look at the cleansing of the temple, there's two things he's going to talk about. He's going to talk about uh, worship without holiness, and he's going to talk about belief without faith. And those two things ought to challenge us, right? They ought to challenge us. Remember, Spurgeon said, the holier a man becomes. The holier a man becomes, the more he mourns over his unholiness, as, as I draw closer to God, as I find my life more and more separated unto him, there will be more and more things that he'll bring to light. Are you guys with me? We talk about the idea of, of holiness. We come to the concept of holiness from a position of brokenness. Not that we can't have victory in our brokenness, but we have to acknowledge I'm broke. I, I'm, there are things in me still 25 years I've been in full-time ministry and I'm still purging and praying and confessing because that's a part of life. And the closer I get to Jesus, it's not the less of that I do. At least that's not what Spurgeon thought. Spurgeon said the closer I get to Jesus, the more my eyes are open the more I recognize these areas within me. And so when we look at Jesus coming here to the temple, we want to look at it in light of that call from Messiah, the prophecy that was given that Messiah would come and call his people to holiness because we're really good at faking. We, we can fake anything. We can fake happiness on any given day, can't we? We can, we can fake so many things. In fact, we have this whole idea that we talk about uh, fake it till you make it. What doesn't really work? What you make is being a fake. Congratulations. <laughs> but that's not our goal, is it? Our goal isn't fakeness. Our goal is to be Christ-like. We want to be like Jesus. We want to be like him. We want to take on his attributes. Now, John says, I write these things so that you might believe Jesus is the Christ. That means he's the anointed one, the son of God. That is a title that declares that he is king of kings and lord of lords, the only true and real leader we'll ever see. Because he is able to do what man cannot. Remember, Daniel gave us a prophecy about the kingdoms of man. What, the, what happens to every kingdom of man? You're, you're watching it on the news every night. What happens to the kingdom of man? It crumbles. His feet are made of clay. What about the kingdom of God? The kingdom of God never crumbles, right? The kingdom of God stands. The kingdom of God is, is empowered because Jesus is the son of God. God in the flesh the real king, the true king. So we want to see that. We want to see that evidenced in worship. 
But as we look at what's going on in the temple for these guys, that's, that's not really what's going on. He begins with the, in verse 13, the Passover of the Jews was at hand. And Jesus went up to Jerusalem. Now we're going to talk about three Passovers in the ministry of, of Jesus. Three years ministry, three Passovers is the first one. First Passover, it says, Jesus went up to Jerusalem, and in the temple he found those who were selling oxen, sheep, pigeons, and the money changers sitting there. Now, here's what he says. He uses an interesting word for in the temple. The word here is hieron. It's a general term for the general area of the temple. Okay, you guys with me? So there are specific words, right? And then there are general words. This is a general word that talks about the the temple area. So he's in the court of the temple, which is a, a big place. A lot of people fit in there. Now, Outside the temple area, before you went up the southern steps into the temple, there was a Teropian Valley. The Teropian Valley was the place where they traditionally used to sell animals for sacrifice. And that was nothing wrong with that. That's not in the temple. That's before you get to the temple. You could go down there and you could see the money changers and all the things that they had set up there. But they had a concept. They had a concept that the high priest began to to purport, and that was that the closer you were to the temple when you bought your, your sacrifice, the holier the sacrifice was. The closer you, so, what are, so they started, the money changers and the, and the people selling sacrifices, they start encroaching on the temple area. You guys understand what I'm saying? So they leave the area that, what, that had the shops in it. There, of course, were guys there, but look, you can buy that one, and that one costs five bucks or whatever, but if you get the one closest to the temple, that's a twenty dollar. That's a better sacrifice, though, for sure, because that makes you holier because you're closer to the temple. They had a malconceived idea of holiness. The holiness is something you can buy. Holiness is something that you can purchase if you just get a little closer. And this was something that God's people have struggled with throughout history. You read the Old Testament prophets, you have a corrupt priesthood over and over and over again. Why? Because they sell holiness. What about church history? Church history, did we ever sell holiness as a church? You know, the church, once upon a time, the church sold something called indulgences. An indulgence was the sale of holiness. So for 20 bucks, you could buy a pocket of holiness, and that 20 bucks made you holy, and then you could go do whatever you wanted to do. You could go sin to your heart's content. In fact, if you knew specifically what sin you wanted to commit, they could sell you a special indulgence for that. So you'd say, you know what, it's time, we're we're having a big party, we're all going to get wasted this weekend, so I need to buy a special indulgence for being wasted. Now, does the Bible teach, go and be wasted? No. What's the Bible say? Be sober-minded, right? Be sober-minded. So so the priesthood would sell these indulgences so that men would think, I paid, now I'm holy. Holy. Can you buy holiness? Can we purchase that? If I buy a sacrifice closer or further away, am I more holy or less holy? And so as Jesus is coming into the temple, listen, as he's coming into the temple, it says he found those. (coughs) He specifically goes to where they're selling them on the temple grounds. The general temple area, which we will know in a moment is going to be the court of the Gentiles, right? Because you don't want to do that stuff in your own neighborhood, so you do it in the neighborhood of the fellows you don't really care that much about. So it says he found it. He went specifically to where they were doing that. Now this corruption, this idea of corruption of the leadership, man, this is... This is something, according to 2 Chronicles 36, it says that the priesthood, the high priesthood, they polluted the house of the Lord that he made holy. Who made the temple holy? Did the priests make the temple holy because because of what they did? Or did the Lord make the temple holy? 
So the scripture would tell us that the priest polluted what God made holy. Now, why was it holy? Because God's presence is there, right? And wherever God's presence is, you have holiness. Remember when Moses comes to this bush that's burning but not being consumed? You guys remember? It's burning, and he comes up to that burning bush. You remember what the Lord said to him? Take off your shoes. Why? Why is the ground holy? Because God's there. God's there. And there's two things we want to understand. One, the place is holy, right, because God's presence is there. And two, God doesn't want anything coming between you and him. So he says, take off your shoes, because this ground is now filled with my presence, and I don't want something between your skin and mine. So take off your shoes. It has nothing to do with there, something's wrong with your shoes. You didn't have Adidas or Nike. You didn't have the right kind of shoes, so it couldn't be holy. That's not what it is. God's saying, take that off. I want your foot, your skin, your flesh touching me. Nothing between us. And that, that comes to symbolize this for me at least, that comes to symbolize this fakeness that we can have, right? I can put on a special face on special days and, and present a holiness that's not real. I'm wearing my shoes. There's something between me and God. And that thing between me and God is, is man-made, and it's so easy to get rid of. How hard is it to kick off your flip-flops? That's pretty easy, right? Kick off your sandals. That's pretty easy. How easy is it to get anything that's separating you from God? You just confess. You say, God, forgive me. Uh, I was wrong. And what does God say he'll do? He'll forgive you. What if I don't do that? Well, I got my shoes on on holy ground, I'm unconfessed. We don't want to see people distracted from holiness because of our fakeness. Part of that is being real, part of that is being confessional. In Isaiah chapter one, Listen to what God says, and hear his heart. He says, what to me is the multitude of your sacrifices, says the Lord? I have had enough of burnt offerings of rams and the fat of well-fed beasts. I do not delight in the blood of bulls or lambs or goats. When you come to appear before me, who has required of you this trampling of my courts? Well, why, why are you here? Why have you come? He says, bring no more vain offerings. Your incense is an abomination to me. New moon and Sabbath and the calling of convocation. This is all the ritual worship. I cannot endure iniquity and the solemn assembly. Did you hear that? Man. I cannot bear iniquity and the solemn assembly. There is something about being men and women willing to be confessional. Being confessional. I had a brother recently confess some struggles that he was having in his life. The Bible says, confess your sin one to another and be healed. That we that we don't try to pretend or fake or, or any of those things. But we just stand up. God knows, don't he? So we say, okay, God, you know, I, I screwed up. I messed up. I fall down on my knees before God. I ask him, Lord, cleanse me. What does 1 John 1, 9 say? If I confess my sins, what does he do? He cleanses me of all unrighteousness, Right? He makes me clean. Why? Because I become perfect now? He makes me clean because I'm covered in what? The blood of Jesus Christ covers me. 
the blood of Jesus Christ. So when I come to worship in holiness, it's not about I wore fancy clothes. It's not about I, I did, those things are not bad nor good. When I come to worship, you guys, we just did worship. And as we were worshiping, my heart would be that during that worship, you're saying, man, God, you don't enjoy my iniquity in the solemn assembly. So when I come here, what shall I do? Confess. I confess. I lay it down and God brings his beautiful forgiveness. He says in verse 14 of Isaiah 1, your new moons, your appointed feast, my soul hates. These are their celebrations. Feast days. God says, I hate them because it's not about you want to come with your shoes on. You don't want to come and, and, and touch me. You don't want to come. You want to come to me with things between us. You want to enter into a holy place with things that defile and then pretend they're not there. And God says, man, I, I don't want that. He says, when you spread out your hands, <clears throat> I will hide my eyes from you. And even though you make many prayers, I will not listen. Because your hands are full of blood. The blood on the hands, guys, it's not necessarily that we're out killing people. It's that we're guilty. I'm guilty. And God's not saying I want you to go through some kind of purgatory or I want you to go through a certain amount of things that you got to pay in order to be made right. God's just saying, look, I want you to be honest with me and take off your shoes. I want you to be honest with me and honestly bear your heart to me. Not for condemnation. We're condemned already. He wants us to do it for forgiveness. He wants us to do it for restoration. He wants us to do it for renewal. Listen to what he says, verse 16. Wash yourselves. Make yourselves clean. Remove the evil of your deeds before my eyes. And cease to do evil. Learn to do good. Seek justice, correct oppression, bring justice to the fatherless, plead the widow's cause. Man, come on. Don't make me go through all those things one at a time. <clears throat> Man, those are all the things wrong with our nation right now. They're all the things wrong with me. They're all the things wrong with you. They're all things and areas where we fall short and we need the empowerment of God's Spirit to overcome. But the key to getting the empowerment of God's Spirit to overcome these issues of unholiness in our life is not to fake it, but to confess it. To confess it. It's not about judgment. It's about having a right heart. It doesn't require some kind of penance I can be made right before God in seconds if I'm willing. If I'm willing to lift my eyes to him, lift my hands to him. We come, Jesus has come, he's found the money changers, and you have to ask the question, why is he angry? Why does it upset him? Because the holiness of God is lost in the chaos of us faking it. The holiness of God. That's what we come here to do. When we worship, we are casting worth on Christ. That's why we sing. We don't sing so that you can be happy or that you like the songs or so you can hear the drums or not hear the drums or any other thing. We sing to put our worth, to cast worth on Christ, period. And we can do that to anything. We just have to be willing Worship is putting value to Jesus, giving value to him, acknowledging who he is. When we come to the word, worship hasn't changed. When we come to the word, we're doing the exact same thing, giving value to Jesus, spending time looking in his word. And God wants us to be real. He wants us to be honest. He wants us to be confessional. If there's an issue... Confess it. Find forgiveness. Be set free. 
Because all that hardness of heart, that don't do nothing but jack you up. Makes you hard. Eventually that hard heart will turn you from the Lord. You'll turn from God's people because God's people are all screwed up. And you'll be frustrated at them being screwed up. But not able to look in the mirror and see the dirt upon your own face. We need to lay down the fake and take up the real. So Jesus made a whip of cords, and he drove them all out of the temple with the sheep and the oxen. He poured out the coins of the money changers, and he overturned their table. I saw a lot of this on Facebook during the riots. Yeah, they were trying to tell me this, that's what they're doing. No, that's not what you're doing. Jesus is driving out the false so that there can be room for the true. Jesus is driving out the chaos of worship, the the nonsense of worship, so that people could once again focus on true worship, having their, their hearts and minds focused on the Lord. He is driving them out. Jesus always gets angry about the right things. You and I always get angry about the wrong things. The wrath of man will never accomplish the righteousness of God. So we, but we, what we see in Christ, we see Christ. He's angry about the right things, but he never loses self-control. That is the opposite of the riots, by the way. The riots are, in fact, the loss of self-control. That's not righteous indignation that's, that maybe start that way, but then, Mob rules takes over, and the next thing you know, we're doing all kind of nonsense. But here, we see that God, here's here's part of our struggle. God is a God of wrath. He's not a God of rage. You and I are a people of rage. We are not a people of wrath. What do I mean? Well, in the Bible, God's wrath is a preordained judgment. We talk about it often when we talk about Scripture. Scripture tells the story of two roads, one that leads to death and one that leads to life. Right? Light, darkness, wisdom, the fool, the lady wisdom, and the immoral woman. You take your pick. There's a lot of different illustrations of the same idea. If you take this road, the path of death, what's at the end? Death. That's the wrath of God. The wrath of God is already laid out. God has not lost self-control. He just said, if you take this road, this is what happens. If you do this, this happens. The Bible uses words, language like fire, burning, when it talks about the wrath of God. It says that it is a fearful thing to fall into the hands of, of a holy God, especially if you fall into those hands and recognize your own state. Jonathan Edwards wrote a whole message about it. You know what it's called? Sinners in the hands of an angry God. What's God angry about? There's a path that leads to wrath. When you get to where that road goes, there's no gripe. You took the path of wrath. You and I are not a people of wrath. We are a people of rage. So we stub our toe and we make things worse by uncorking the beast and letting him eat. And the next thing you know, we broke whatever we stubbed our toe on or we busted a window or we busted a door or we dented a car or whatever because we explode. God doesn't explode. God has wrath. We want to walk the path of light. We want to travel the path of life. So Jesus is angry. He's angry about the right things, false worship, false attitude. He takes a a group of ropes and he binds them together and he drives them out. Get out of here. And they leave. Why? Some people say they leave because Jesus was burly. Maybe he was. I hope you have a burly Jesus. I like the idea. I think the people left because as soon as somebody stood up and said, this is wrong, they 
knew it. So what did they do? But they didn't fight. The fight's going to come from the guys who told these guys to be there. Jesus is going to take the whip and he's going to drive them out. And honestly, I don't think there was a whole lot of whipping going on. He started hollering, this is unholy. This, my father's house, is supposed to be a house of prayer. You've made it a den of thieves. <clears throat> and they all knew it. They knew two things. One, prophecy said the Messiah would come in one day and clean house. And two, there's a dude in here who's cleaning house. And we're doing wrong. Right? So I think they, these guys... They go. And I know that Jesus is in absolute self-control. I know he's in self-control because he doesn't kill the birds. We'll see that in the next verse. He told those who sold pigeons, take these things away. Look, when rage comes out of Jackie, the pigeons' cages get broke. <laughs> Throwing cages on the ground, kicking things across the room. You ain't never done that? Am I, I'm the only one who has rage. I'm trying to fix something, and I'm cranking down on that wrench, and it slips, and I bust my knuckles. What do I do with the wrench? Oh, I don't set it down. <clears throat> I don't even know where half my wrenches are. <laughs> that wrench is bouncing off of something. <clears throat> Rage never makes it better. But the wrath of God, the wrath of God, is a signpost on the road calling men to repentance. The rage of man doesn't do that. God is a God of wrath. God is a God of love. God is a God of justice. All the attributes of God are, are, he's not half one thing, half another. He's all it. And he's all it righteously and wholly. But we have a hard time understanding that because you and I, we're messed up creatures. We're broken, right? So we have a hard time understanding the anger of God. Yes? Because we think it's like ours. We have a hard time understanding the justice of God. Why? Because we think it's like ours. We have a hard time understanding the righteousness of God. Because what? We think it's like ours. But all of those things in God are, are wholly other than us. We are trying as believers in Jesus Christ to reflect true justice, true righteousness, true love, right? True wrath, true justice. We want to be like him. But we have this tendency to just focus on one thing and forget about all the rest. But God is whole. God is complete so Jesus, he, he is purifying. Now listen, what's going on? The people, this is why I think the people leave. Malachi 3, 1 through 3, the last book of the Old Testament before God was silent for 400 years until a crazy prophet showed up who was eating locusts and honey and started saying things like, behold the Lamb of God that takes away the sin of the world. So the last word from God before the crazy prophet, John the Baptist, pointed out Jesus Christ, here's what Malachi said. Malachi chapter three. Behold, I send my messenger, <coughs> and he will prepare the way before me. That's John the Baptist. He's gonna prepare the way. He's gonna make it visible so people can see the Christ. And the Lord whom you seek will suddenly come to his temple. What are we just reading? The Lord, the King, the the. Son of God, the one, the ruler you want, he's going to just appear one day in the temple. And it says, he will come to the temple and the messenger of the covenant in whom you delight. Behold, he is coming, says the Lord of hosts. But who can endure the day of his coming? Who can stand, <coughs> excuse me, when he appears? For he is like the refiner's fire and the fuller's soap. He's going to wash away the fake, right? And that what the refiner's fire does? Purifies the gold, right? Purifies the silver. Purify me. What's it, what's it getting out? The dross, the garbage. Yes. We sing a song, right? Refiner's fire. Yeah. Purify me, Lord. He is a purifier. Listen, verse 3, he will sit as a refiner, a purifier of silver. He will purify the sons of Levi. He's going to purify the sons of Levi. 
the priests. He's going to refine them like gold and silver, and they will bring offerings and righteousness to the Lord. So he's saying, man, he's going to purify them. And here, suddenly, he comes into the temple, and he starts shouting, you guys shouldn't be here. You guys shouldn't be here. This is not where you should be. He has the ability to denounce their practice. This is not right. In a moment, they're going to ask him by what authority. And so he's going to cast them out. Listen to what he says. Do not make my father's house a house of trade. Don't make, he didn't say our father's house. He said my father's house. Listen, there is a way, there is a part of the relationship between Jesus, the Son of God, and God the Father that we don't share in. There are times when Jesus is going to say to his disciples, I must return to my Father and your Father. What does that mean? He's my Father in a different way than he's yours. That's a way you can't share. Because Jesus is part of the triune God. He is part of, of the, the perfect and holy unity of God. So that all of God must be moving in the same direction at the same time. Now, I'm not going to bog down in theology because I'll lose you all. But the point is, the Father can't do something that the Son is opposed to. The Son can't do something that the Father is opposed to. The Spirit can't do something any of them are opposed to. They all move in the same direction. The Bible calls it unity, oneness. Hero Israel, the Lord your God, he is one God. All moving in one direction. In every aspect, in salvation, in creation, in the resurrection, in everything. So Jesus is saying, look, my father, this is his house. What's he saying? This is holy ground. What's going on in this holy ground is putting something between you and God. <clears throat> now there's noise, there's chaos, there's all this other stuff that has nothing to do with the holiness of God. <clears throat> it doesn't have anything to do with directing our attention toward him. So he's saying, look, you can't make my father's house a house of trade. You can't make it that. It needs to be holy. In Isaiah 56, 7, it says, I, bring, I will bring to my holy mountain and make them joyful in my house of prayer. Their burnt offerings or sacrifices will be accepted in my altar, for my house shall be called a house of prayer, listen, for all people. For the goyim. It's interesting because in our world today, we can see the very thing Jesus talked about in Matthew 24. <clears throat> we miss it. Sometimes when we're doing our prophecy stuff, people get a little nutty sometimes over prophecy. None of you guys, but other people get nutty over prophecy. And Jesus said, nation will rise up against nation. There will be wars and rumors of war, but the end is not yet. These things must come, but the end is not yet. When he's talking about nation rising up against nation, do you know what he's saying? In the Greek, it's ethnos will rise up against ethnos. That means there will be ethnic division throughout the world. People will divide according to ethnicity. Is that happening? He says these things will come. But now here in Isaiah, Isaiah the prophet is saying, but God's house is supposed to be a house for all goyim, all nations, all ethnicities, all people. It's supposed to be a place for everyone, for all peoples. But there, in the court of the Gentile, which is the court of the goyim, the people, just the regular people. You want me to drown myself in water? <clears throat> um, maybe I just holler too much. Yeah. Two people say preach it, and everybody else says, be quiet. Thank you. Oh, hopefully that'll work. We'll see. Stay. Okay. The court of the Gentiles, court of the goyim, court, court of the people is where they have 
all the beasts they're selling. Chaos is in the place where all the nations are supposed to be able to gather before God and pray. But as they're trying to gather and pray, you got money changers trying to change your money, which was a whole crooked thing in itself. And you have guys trying to sell things for sacrifice, saying they're more holy than other things. <clears throat> All these other things are creating chaos. And Jesus said, this is not how my father's house is. My father's house is a house of prayer for all people. Everyone should be able to gather. Everyone shall be able to come to this place. It says in verse 17 of John 2, so his disciples remembered it was written, zeal for your house will consume me. In Psalm 69, 9, it says, for the zeal for the house has consumed me and the reproaches of those who reproach you have fallen on me. Zeal for your house. It's the idea of a zeal, a desire to see the holiness of God. To see the holiness of God. The best way for you to see the holiness of God is not to stare at my holiness. That's going to frustrate you. You need to see the glory of God. You need to ask God to show you. Show me your glory. Isn't that what Moses declared? Show me your glory. God, show me your glory. I want to see you. I want to see who you are. We want to be able to see this glory. Now, that's not to say my holiness doesn't matter. It does matter. But my holiness, though the Bible calls me to be perfect as he is perfect, to be holy as he is holy, it's going to depend on my repentance, confession, and drawing closer to him, recognizing like Spurgeon said, the closer I get to him, the more work I see God needs to do in me. Agreed? So I need God to do that work. I want God to do that work in me. I want Jesus. I want to see his glory. I want to have my eyes on him. Paul doesn't say, <clears throat> here's the one thing I do. Forgetting those things which lie behind, I press on putting my eyes on Apollos. I put my eyes on John, the beloved. No, where does he say he puts his eyes? I put my eyes on Jesus. And I do what? I march forward. There's no retreat in the, in the army of God. There's only advance. Because the victory has been won. There's no retreat. We keep moving forward. That's why Jesus would say, when you go and you share the gospel with somebody and they don't want to receive it, what's he say? He didn't say retreat. What's he say? Shake off the dust and do what? Keep going. Keep moving. Keep driving. Keep going forward. So as soon as Jesus does this, all the high priests, they're looking at him and they're saying, hey, 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 hey. We all know the prophecy that Messiah is going to clean house one day and you're not the first guy who showed up and decided he was going to clean house. You might be the first guy who actually got it done, but you're not the first guy who's ever done this. So they're going to ask him for something. What are they going to ask him for? They're going to say, give us a sign. So the Jews say, what sign do you show us for these things? What sign? Jesus always gave the same sign. The sign that Jesus is, who he said he was, is the resurrection. The resurrection is a sign. The tomb is empty. He is risen, just as he said. The tomb is empty. They seek for a sign. Matthew 12, Jesus said, <clears throat> Teacher, the scribes say, we want to see a sign from you. And he said, An evil and adulterous generation seeks after a sign, and none will be given it except the sign of Jonah. For as Jonah was three days and three nights in the belly of the great fish, so the Son of Man will be three days and three nights in the bowels of the earth. The resurrection is a sign that he is who he said he is. So they're saying, well, by what authority do you do this? And he said, you'll know because you're going to kill me and I'm going to come back. You heard what he said? He says, look, they say, give us a sign. He said, he's looking at them, you destroy this naos. 
Remember I told you before he used a general term for the temple? That means the whole temple area. Well, here he uses the word for the holies. This is a specific word, naos, the holiest place. He's saying, hey, you destroy, you destroy this naos. And in three days, I'll raise it up. You destroy this holy of holies. And they respond in the same way. <clears throat> the Jews said it took 46 years to build this naos. In fact, it still wasn't done. They were still working on the building at the time of Christ. They don't finish the temple until 64 AD, six years before it's destroyed by the Romans. So while they're doing their, their work on it, the Jews say, it took 46 years to build this temple and you'll raise it up in three days? What's the scripture say? But he was speaking of the temple of his body. Who's going to destroy his body? The guys who are there asking for a sign. The scribes and the Pharisees. The rulers of the Jews. <clears throat> so he says, hey, destroy it and I will raise it up. This is the sign that I am who I say. That I have the authority to do what has been done. So in verse 22 it says, therefore... When he was raised from the dead, his disciples remembered. When did they remember? It tells us, right? When, therefore, he rose from the dead. So when did the disciples remember? After he rose from the dead. Oh, wow. You remember what Jesus said about the temple? Dang. Here we are three days later. He did, he did what he said he was going to do. Wow. Now what does that mean? The disciples didn't understand everything. They didn't understand everything all the way to the day of the ascension. The Bible says when Jesus ascended to the heavens, that it says in Scripture that some disciples believed and some doubted. They're looking at him go up. Because you and I, we have real struggles being and believing the things God wants us to be and believe. So a few days later, Jesus told the disciples to be gathered together and he was going to send something even better than his presence. Do you remember? And on the birthday of the church, the church... Peter, James, John, the disciples were baptized with the Holy Spirit and that's when their lives were radically transformed. Yes? Now Peter who was afraid and couldn't stand up for Christ is going to face a beating and then say, well, I don't know whether you think we should obey you or Christ, but we can't do nothing other than do what Christ says. That's a different guy than was standing at the campfire and a girl walks up to him and says, weren't you with Jesus? What makes him different? Power of the Holy Spirit, right? The power of the Holy Spirit that enables us to be who we need to be. The disciples remember, verse 23, it says, now when he was in Jerusalem at the Passover feast, many believed in his name. <laughs> Here's our trouble. Many believed in his name when they saw the signs that he was doing. Oh, then they must all be saved, right? Many, it says here, many believed, so, so they, must, they must be saved. But then you have the next verse. It doesn't stop there. But Jesus, on his part, did not believe in any of them. That's what it says in the Greek. They believed in him, but he didn't believe in them because he knows what's in a man. He knows what's in a man. What were they lacking? We just hinted on it. What were those guys lacking? They're lacking the presence of the Holy Spirit in their life. The empowerment of God to overcome our fakeness. Relying on the power of the Holy Spirit. Walking in accordance with the power of the Holy Spirit. Being empowered by His Spirit is what transforms our life. The power of the Holy Spirit brings about the power of the resurrection. The power of the resurrection is the power to be a new 
creation. Because I have the power of Jesus Christ flaring within me. These guys, they had belief, but no faith. They had belief, but no spirit. The spirit is what anchors that belief. Now the Bible tells us that when you put your trust in Jesus Christ, the Holy Spirit enters into your life. It happens right then. He comes. But the Bible also tells us that there's an empowerment of the Holy Spirit. And that we have to learn to walk in and hold fast to that empowerment. Lord, empower me. Acts chapter 4. Peter just had his big thing. Standing before the Sanhedrin, he stood up for Jesus. And he comes back to the other disciples. He says, oh, guys, 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 man. <laughs> Things are going to get dicey. There's going to be persecution. People are going to come after us. They already tried to beat me and John, and I'm, I'm a little bit afraid, and I'm afraid I'm not going to have the boldness I need to have. I'm afraid I'm not going to have the guts to do it again. So the Bible says, Acts chapter 4, you read it. They decided to pray, oh God, you got to help us, because I don't think I have the strength in me to do this. And the Bible says that whole place was shook. And they were filled with the Holy Spirit, empowered by the Holy Spirit, and were given boldness. You probably thought I was going to say something else, huh? Well, there's that too. But between you and me, you need more boldness and you need that. We need boldness. Where do we find that boldness? Where do we find the strength? By the power of the Holy Spirit, who is given to us by who? Jesus Christ. He gave us the Holy Spirit. He says here, I know man. In the Psalms, guys, in the Psalms, he says, look, <clears throat> I know your frame. I have pity on you like a father pities his children. For I know your frame, you are dust. When's the last time you guys saw a dirt clod and expected a lot out of it? You look over at that dirt clod and say, man, look, here's a dirt clod. Bunch of dirt stuck together. Be holy. Did a dirt cloud become holy? How does a dirt cloud become holy? By being in the presence of God. How do you become holy? Be in the presence of God. How do I get into the presence of God? Everyone who calls on the name of the Lord. Everyone who lifts their eyes to heaven. That's what the scripture declares. That the Lord will visit his children Many believed, but Jesus didn't believe in them. Why? Because he knew them. He didn't need anyone to tell him what man was about. He knows man. Man is a dirt clod. Read the Psalms. Who is man that you care for him? What is man? David would say, who am I? I would say the same thing. Look, in cleansing the temple, Jesus is attacking the fakeness of worship. Get all that fake ideas of holiness. I buy this beast closer to the temple. I'm more holy. He's exposing their greed. He's exposing their sin. He's exposing what they know is there. He's proclaiming, look, this is supposed to be a place where people can gather and be in prayer, seeking the face of God. And he fulfilled prophecy. Why did John tell us this story? Well, Jesus did a lot of things that aren't written in this book, but these are written that you might believe Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and believing you may have life in his name. Amen? Why don't you stand with me? Let's pray. Father God, we thank you for this time, the opportunity that we have to seek your face. We thank you for your scripture, Lord. We thank you for your word. Thank you for the challenge of your word today. I thank you for the challenge in my own fakeness. How easy it is to put on a face and just forget about the anger, the, 
night before. The wrath of the weak, the struggle, the... But God, you're calling us to a lifestyle. And the lifestyle isn't just about Sundays. The lifestyle is about every day. About every day seeking your presence. About every day seeking your face. About every day drawing nearer to you and recognizing as I get closer to your holiness, the unholiness in my life is highlighted for the purpose of confession and repentance so that I can draw closer to you still, so that I can see your glory, so that I can see your beauty, so that I can proclaim that beauty to others, that others would come to enjoy the beauty of Christ, the forgiveness of Christ, the righteousness of Christ imputed upon us as we trust in him. God, I just pray that our world, man, it's, it's sideways, it's crazy, things are going, going wild. And there may come persecution. And there may come very hard days ahead. And we need boldness. We don't need to fake it till you make it. We need to cast off fakeness. We need to take off our shoes and stand on holy ground. We need to ask for a vision of you to be able to see your glory. We need to ask that there be nothing between me and you. And if there is something, some shadow that falls between me and you, God, may you bring it to my lips that I might confess it. Not trying to justify my sin or walk in my iniquity and say it's not there. Because God sees it. You can fool me. You can fool everybody. But you cannot fool the Lord. And he's the only one that matters. You can be right with him. But you can't be fake with him. It doesn't matter whether you drop money in the box at the back of church. Or you buy the CDs. Or you do whatever things you think are making you more holy. What makes you more holy is taking off those things that separate you from God. Kick off your shoes. Don't let there be something between you and him. Confess, repent, trust and as we get closer and closer, just like Moses, the glory of Jesus Christ will shine more clear and more clear in us. And that's how we change a world. Not by proclaiming with our lips necessarily, but rather seeing the truth, the light of Christ reflecting off of us as we draw near to him. And God will give us the boldness and the words and the things that need to be said. But he got to have the real. He's got to have the real you. Your real heart. Your real mind. Your real body. He loves you. And he will make you new. So trust him. God, be magnified in this place as we put our eyes on you. And if there's anybody here today that wants to know you, I pray that they'd come see me. I'd love to introduce you. We give you all praise and all glory in this place. In Jesus' name, amen. We make miracle work, promise keep light in the darkness my god that is who you are we make miracle work promise keep light in the darkness my god that is who you are we make miracle work promise keep Light in the darkness, my God, that is who you are. We make miracle work.
worker, promise keeper, light in the darkness, my God, that is who you are. Amen. You guys be blessed. I'll just say a quick prayer for you. Lord, bless your people. Keep your people in your midst, Lord. We thank you so much for all that you do. And Lord, I thank you for the dads that are in this place as well. Lord, bless them today. In Jesus' name, amen. in the dark